Live from Las Vegas, it's theCUBE. Covering AWS reInvent 2017. Presented by AWS, Intel, and our ecosystem of partners. Hey, welcome back everyone. Live here in Las Vegas for AWS reInvent. Day one coverage of three days of theCUBE. I'm John Furrier, the host this week. We got two sets, our fifth year covering reInvent. It's been great to watch. Every year we try to get in the VC panels. We just had Jerry Chen on from Greylock. We got two more uh, awesome friends of theCUBE in the community here. We got Sunil Dalawal, who is the founder of Amplify uh, Ventures, and Nick Sturillo with Ignition Partners. Guys, great to see you. Great to Good see, to see you, you, John. Boy, what a lineup it's been over the past three years, four years with Amazon. Just watching them tear, it's like, now it's all steam ahead. Microsoft's totally gearing up. You can see them playing what they're doing, they're pedaling as fast as they can. Google playing the new guard. We're going to compete on TensorFlow and other little goodness, a lot more to go. You got Alibaba Cloud. Intel behind us is making all more chips. <laughs> Good market on paper. Yeah. But we're transcending startups kind of get bought, not for what they wanted. It didn't go public, sky high from Greylock. You see Barracuda going private. A lot of money to be made. Maybe the investment thesis of $200 million fundings, that's over. Is it over? Or is it get a little bit of cash and get the critical mass and... Well, here's, here's the question. Do you invest in these companies thinking every one of them is going to go public, or do you think that a good number of them are going to get acquired? And I think the investors that have done this for a while, and Nick's done this for what, like 45 years? <laughs> I started when I was two, so. <laughs> uh, I've, done this, I've done this like two years less than you have, so I don't pretend I'm, I'm dramatically younger. But the reality is these companies get acquired. And you know, pretending that you're going to pile into a company late and expect every single thing to go public, I think it's kind of crazy. Yeah. And, and the people that are getting caught in that, in that trap, I think they're going to be in for a rude awakening. But look, you get a billion six outcome for Barracuda, right? That was pretty damn good. And you know, I, I, sky high number hasn't been printed, but it wasn't a small one. Like, those are good outcomes. Those are good venture returns if you were smart about where you got in. So I would slightly different perspective, which is, the real issue is that so much money moved into the late stage, and these companies thought that growth would always be linear or even asymptotic, and so what happens is, is that their growth rate slows down and the cost of growth goes up, and suddenly the company's not quite as hot as it was a year ago, and so now the options for what they do have shrunk dramatically, and so you get exits like you just mentioned. And so part of the problem is, is that uh, entrepreneurs and investors really have to have a sober view of what is a business model that's durable over time and which ones really are going to start to leak in their later phases. Well, it's a kind of a planted question for you guys because you, know, you do early stage at Amplify and been following you guys, do a great job. You guys do a range of early and growth. Mostly early though. The, the days of just laying back and kicking your feet up and throwing cash at stuff is over. You actually got to do the work. It sounds like old school VCs, Greg Sands and I talk about this all the time. You got to go in and be venturing. You got to actually make it work John, that sucks. Models. I was told that I just put my feet up, I put some money in, and then this, I get a distribution I check mean, at the end of it. That's what everyone thinks you guys do. What do you guys do every day? Take us through your day. <laughs> it, it, looks a lot like, it looks a lot like that, I except mean, it's so uh, easy to be a VC. All you do is, okay, yes, no, okay, that's good. We got a dartboard. All you got to do is bet on the good ones. Yeah. It's so easy. So there are what? 14,000 <laughs> startups in the Bay Area. How many of them are worthwhile, you think? It's a lot of work. Well, old school, let's go back to the old school tactics because you're seeing a couple things going on. You guys are essentially pointing it out. You got to do the work and, and pick the winners. But now that the business models are changing, right? You're yeah. seeing Amazon just ignoring conventional wisdom and they're winning. The yes. game is changing a bit and the business model side. How are you guys looking at that as you make investments? Obviously, you get the classic venture, make bet on a good team, do all that stuff. What do you guys look at now in the marketplace for fit, scale, sure. longevity, durability? I mean, the stuff we care about the most is, are you going after a big problem? Because I think a lot of stuff we see, even if you have great teams and great technologies, but you step back and you actually think, you know, that isn't a company, that's a product, or that's not even a product, that's a feature. And there's, you know, and I think that's the natural outgrowth of what happens when you get 14,000 startups in the Bay Area is yeah. there aren't 14,000 products that are, are, are companies Vital. worth, that, worth yeah. having. What you have is, you know, probably 12,000 features, you know, yeah. 1,500 or, you know, company or products and then, then like 500 real companies. And that's probably the biggest filter that you got to apply on the way in. And it's maybe the hardest one to, to solve for, which is, roll this out seven years, nine years, because that's really what you're talking about when you're talking about building a public, durable company is, what does this market look like way down the road, and is that a thing? 
that can stand alone. Yeah. And that's, that's, the, that's really, I think, the difference between the companies and the investors that do really well and the ones that can kind of squeeze by knocking out a couple interesting outcomes. Yeah, My thoughts? favorite thing is that when you say we just pick the winners, is that nobody knows who the winner is a priori. Yeah. If you knew that, that market would be gone already. And most successful companies that you read about, and they talk about the prescient investors that were in it early, that's all BS. Yeah. It's a million good things happen along the way, serendipity, a ton of hard work on the management team and the employees. So this idea that things are preordained is just silly. And I would tell you that you look at most really successful companies today, their business model is completely different than the one yeah. that the venture person backed. I mean, it's always the classic case. Remember when I first started an entrepreneur in the 90s, was like, the question was, what's your exit strategy? It was a legit question at that time, and it was yeah. kind of a peg mark. Okay, we want to build a growing company and, and have an exit. Now the exits are, as you mentioned, buyers, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. If Microsoft's at a race to fill in their white spaces, Man, I would crop up and get the crops growing, right? So you can say, okay, Microsoft, so you guys got to kind of do a little bit of homework there, do some relationship work, and you guys yes. are close to Microsoft, yeah. so. Yes. I mean, is that kind of the new playbook? I mean, yes. how should entrepreneurs posture to this? I mean, obviously, they're going to try to build a durable venture, but they don't want to be zigzagging too much or pivoting. No. Yeah. I mean, Nick made the point earlier, which I think is absolutely the one to focus on, which is when you raise a ton of capital, your options start to shrink. You know, the, the more you money you raise at the higher and higher price, there's, yeah. some, there's somebody you got to serve who's thinking about the even bigger pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. And honestly, when we look at, I'll take one company in our portfolio, for example, and then I think, you know, the Splunk story is right up there with it. If you look at Datadog, Datadog's huge here at this show, yep. right? There's purple shirts everywhere and a massive booth, and, and they've been here for five years running or four years running. Um, that business has barely touched the last round of capital they raised, let alone the round of capital before that, the capital efficiency of that business, not only does it make it a great, is going to make it a great outcome, but it's going to give them tons of options of things that they can do. And you know, they'll get to make every single decision they make, whether it's going to a new product or whatever, position of strength. And not a lot of companies do that. Yeah. So Splunk started in 2004. Guess how much total the company raised before it went public? How much? 40 million. Guess how much it spent up to the time it went public. How much? 25. I mean, so it went very capital fifth. efficient. Think about that. Yes, and it's worth nine billion now, and so you had several hundred millionaires created out of Splunk, and I would submit to you, if Splunk was started today, it, the investor community would have killed it. Why? Because we would have, 18 Brinks trucks would have backed up and dumped a billion dollars on top yeah. of it and buried it in too much money without allowing the company to get the time to, to become a fully viable system. Yeah. So the too much cash can create toxicity for the startup. Money rarely makes the company. Money rarely makes the company. All right, I mean, that's good. Lou Cerny was on earlier, founder of New Relic, another capital efficient great, company. Great went company. public, all time high. Love that guy, he's such a strong, he writes code, wrote, wrote some code last week. He, he said, if you can help your partners be successful in referring to Amazon, Amazon, then you can be a great ecosystem partner. So the question now is it's not a bad deal for a company to jump into the cloud game and be a really good partner and build a kick-ass product. Yes. And look like a feature maybe on paper and then sequence to an opportunity. Thoughts on that? That's uh, certainly lucrative if you can get the flywheel going, right? So if you, you, you don't want to build a company whose basic thesis is helping Amazon or Azure or Google, that is a dead company. If, however, you pull revenue for one of those three in a way that's interesting to them, they will support you all day long. We have two companies in particular, uh, Isertus and Kensai, that are pulling a lot of revenue for Azure right now, and Microsoft gives them extraordinary support. And so that's it works when right it there. works. That's the nuance right there. That's the nuance. Pulling revenue, value, creation. Yes. Well, they've, they've created Amazon and Microsoft and Google to, to a degree as they get going, they've created a really interesting model which is unlike your traditional ecosystem, hub and spoke model where someone's going to capture the much of value, control the sale, et cetera, et cetera. The smart thing that Amazon's done is they say, you use whatever you want. We'll, we'll, we're going to bill you for the primitives till the cows come home. And if, as long as you're not standing in the way in between Amazon and their primitives revenue, you're going to do great. All right, final question for you guys. First of all, great conversation on the capital markets. Certainly it's crazy, we always try to cover it. But here's a thought exercise. Last night we were at the Analyst Summit. We were talking to some analysts, and the, que and the question was, the airplane's going down, and you're in a board meeting, and I got to pick a parachute. 
There's only three parachutes. Amazon, Microsoft, and Google. Which one do you get? You got 10 seconds. To sell to or? No, just grab a parachute to, and you hope that it opens and you, and you live. Pick a parachute. Amazon. I'm going, with, I'm going with Amazon. This one isn't hard. Microsoft and Google. Yeah, the, the, only, the only person who's going to grab the Microsoft parachute is the guy who's been with Microsoft for 30 years and knows they're not going to let him down. If you're a forward facing company, you're going with Amazon. And if you're nuts, you're going to grab Google right now. No offense to my friends at Google. Well, so we're sitting here at reInvent, so I feel like that's a trick question. <laughs> 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 well, that's a good one. If you're in the Microsoft ecosystem, they do take care of their own. They, they do. They are, the, the, the their DNA is tuned to ISVs. They're very good at it. And that's their track record. Well, the one guy says, well, it depends. I go, well, you, by the time you argue with the parachute, yes. you, the plane's yes, dead. So, but it does depend if you're on your business. Yes. Yeah. All right. But it is hard not to look at this show and say, this is what electricity was. Yeah. In 1920. All right, yeah. final question. Obviously, Amazon's looking at all steam ahead. Uh, business models are changing. You're starting to see the stop of the stack develop nicely. Moving up the stack seems to be the trend. Um, you got this decentralized market up there. Bitcoin hit 10,000. A lot of smart alpha geeks, including some of the guys here at the Cube team, is looking at ways to kind of leverage this decentralization trend in a way that's productive. Yet there's a lot of scams out there with these ICOs. Decentralization, good or just another infrastructure dynamic? Thoughts on this whole decentralized token economics wave? Also, the SEC has regulations now in it. Is it disrupting VC? Your thoughts, Nick. Do you remember what H.L. Mencken said? A fool and his money are soon parted. <laughs> so I think anyone who sits there and says, I understand completely what an ICO is and what I'm buying, and, and doesn't view it as something that'll be a tax deduction for next year, I think is going to be in for uh, a bumpy ride. Get, get, get out your Gartner hype cycle, and if you don't know what it is, go look it up. And there's a spot right now of where we are in the hype cycle, and I think my, the, the movement I finger tells you where we are. But, this is coming, I heard but this, this comes afterwards. I heard this argument with the web, it's just for kids. No one will ever use the web. Browsers for to it's a to toy. Okay, and memory's yep. all you'll ever need. Yeah, but guess what, guess what, 2001, happened before we got to 2017. So let's, let's never forget where we are at that time. Well, ICOs of are like subprime mortgages. Yeah. It, and and I, I speak Spanish and I can't even read the thing. Yeah. That is what an ICO so is. So certainly hyped up, winter's coming, we'll see. All right, we got the VCs here, Nick and Sunil, we got uh, Amplify and Ignition Partners here in theCUBE. More live coverage, day one after this short break. <laughs>